a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast, we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and other interesting topics to educate, inspire, and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host, Yusuf, and for this episode of the podcast, I'm very excited to welcome Kim Crawley and Philip Wiley, authors of the book, The Pentester Blueprint, starting a career as an ethical hacker, to my show. Kim Crawley is dedicated to researching and writing about a plethora of cybersecurity issues. Some of the companies Kim has worked for over the years include Sophos, AT&T Cybersecurity, BlackBerry, Silence, Tripwire, and Venafi. All matters Red Team, Blue Team, and Purple Team fascinate her. But she's especially fascinated by malware, social engineering, and advanced persistent threats. Kim's extracurricular activities include running an online cybersecurity event called DisInfoSec and Autistic Self-Advocacy. Philip Wiley is a lead curriculum developer at Point3 Federal, adjunct instructor at Dallas College, and the Pawn School Project founder. Philip has 23 years of experience with the last 8.5 years spent as a pen tester. Philip has a passion for mentoring and education. His passion motivated him to start teaching and founding the Pawn School Project. The Pawn School Project is a monthly educational meetup focusing on ethical hacking. Philip teaches ethical hacking and web application pen testing at Dallas College in Dallas. Philip holds the following certifications, CISSP, NSAIAM, OSCP, and GWAPT. In this very interesting podcast, Kim, Phil, and I talked about what pen testing actually means, what the legal limit of a pen tester looks like, how the day of a pen tester looks like, what operating systems pen testers use, and Kim and Phil talking about how you can become a pen tester and how to delve into this fascinating subject. For updates on upcoming podcasts, projects, and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter, engineeredmind.sh, where I share exclusive content, visit yusef.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Kim Crawley and Philip Wiley. So, hey, Kim and Phil, it's really great to have you on my podcast. Um, as always, we want to get started with each of you introducing themselves to the audience. Maybe, ladies first, Kim, if you want to start, let's go. Oh, okay. Well, I have been writing and researching about pretty much all areas of cybersecurity for a, a bit over a decade now. Um, I have lots of interests in the field. I'm, I'm fascinated by cyber attacks and malware. I'm very interested in information security careers, which is what our book is about. And I just, I just really enjoy... I really enjoy sharing my knowledge and learning something new every day. That's great. Phil, if you want to continue. Yes, uh, I've been in IT and information security for a little over 23 years. Been in security specifically set for a little over, coming up on almost 17 years. I've worked in uh, network security. The, plat the past eight and a half years have been in offensive security. Uh, specializing in penetration testing and red teaming, and also teach ethical hacking and web app pen testing at Dallas College. So I've really gotten into teaching and mentoring over the past several years. And so that's re really part of uh, where the idea from the book came from. It was originally my first day of class lecture, and then other professors at the college asked for me, for me to come in and talk to their students about pen testing and then in 2018, I gave the conference talk for the very first time. So this month makes the two-year anniversary of the talk mm -hmm. that the book is based on. That's great. So I'm not super familiar with pen testing, but what I've had read from your book is that this pen test blueprint formula is basically you need tech knowledge, hacking knowledge, and the hacker mindset. And we will talk about that during the podcast. And um, maybe we can start with because the audience is mainly engineers from my side, what is pen testing and can you compare it to hacking or what's the difference? Maybe you can explain it in a bit more detail. Pen, pen testing is basically ethical hacking is a term that people are more common with and it's using uh, attacker techniques to test the security. Because, and part of the reason you need to do this is 
if uh, if you don't find the vulnerabilities before the attackers do, then you know a nation state or some bad actor is going to hack into your technology. So therefore, it's it's needed to test. And you know this is really neat in all areas, but very popular in applications. That's why you see all the bug bounties. So that goes to show some of the need for that. So that's basically it. It's uh, using hacking techniques to test, and that's why you hear the term ethical hacker or pen tester. It's easier for people who are non-technical or not in the industry to understand. Hmm. Kim, do you want to add anything here? Um, hacking is all exploring technology, basically. Like if you find a new thing to do with a script or a device, that's hacking. Um, pen testing is a specific kind of hacking. Uh, sometimes people call it ethical hacking. So you are simulating what a cyber attacker would do to see if you can find any security vulnerabilities. And then your job is to report on those security vulnerabilities to your client. Got it. So, yeah. So it's it's pen testing when you have the consent of the client who owns the network that you're testing. Mm -hmm. It's cyber attacking if you don't have that consent. That's a very good point that you mentioned this because the next question would have been, where is the legal limit? Like how far can you go as a pen tester? Um, when a pen tester signs a contract with a pen testing client, it will define very specifically what's allowed, what isn't allowed, what is the scope of the pen test, and your job is to abide by that contract. Like if you're only supposed to run network vulnerability scans on a specific network segment, if you test outside of that network segment, you violate the contract. So you must abide by that contract. If you work within those boundaries and within that scope, then that's your professional responsibility. Okay. Philip, anything else from your side? Or do you fully 100% agree with what Kim said? Yeah, those are very, very good points. You, you need to stay in scope. And if someone goes to work as a pen tester, that's important to stay in scope because, you know, you could get into legal issues. If, if you take down a server and it causes production issues and it's outside the scope, then that's legal problems for yourself. And as Kim mentioned, getting permission Uh, you want to get written, written permission. So in your contract with uh, the customer, in your rules of engagement, you want to outline all the, the, the scope and all that and make sure you're staying within that because otherwise, you know, you could get legal problems. And also, too, if you're doing like bug bounties, make sure you're going through a bug bounty company or an official bug bounty program. Sometimes people will find bugs and stuff and maybe accidentally, but you want to make sure that you're you have permission Uh, with bug bounties, if you go through that, there's some protection opposed to just finding bugs. And some people have actually went through bug bounty programs and companies have came back and either not wanted to pay them or either uh, try to take some legal recourse because I guess bugs got uncovered that they really don't want to get uncovered, which also leads into um, there's an organization that Kim and I are both a part of. It's called Hacking is Not a Crime. And what they do, we're trying to help Show the world that not all hackers are bad. I mean, it's like it's like a locksmith. You know, lock picking can be used for good. You lock yourself out of your car or your home. The locksmith comes and lets you in. But some people can use those same skills for for bad. And it's the same thing with with hacking. Mm -hmm. I completely. That's agree. an excellent analogy comparing ethical hackers to lock pickers. Definitely. Yeah. Before we go into lock locksmiths. Yeah. Yes. Not lock pickers. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Before we go into the technical details, um, maybe a um, funny question. How does a day of a pen tester look like? Maybe, Kim, if you want to start, how does your day look like? Um, I don't work full time in any sort of red teamer or pen testing capacity. Although, interestingly enough, I recently got a client who asked me to test the effectiveness of pretty much every major antivirus application for consumers for Windows 10. So in a sense, I am ethically hacking my Windows 10 virtual machine. I have a massive collection of malware that I unzip inside of my Windows 10 virtual machine. 
and I look at the logs for whatever antivirus software I'm testing, and I report on how much of that malware was detected, how quickly were, were, were any malware samples able to be quarantined, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I have a little bit of experience doing security testing, but quite frankly, Phil is the much more experienced uh, ethical hacker, so. Does the day look any different, Phil? Although you're more experienced? <laughs> yeah, the day it's 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 kind of, you know, the you know, with pen test, one of the things people don't think about when they're wanting to get into it, they see the fun hacking side of it, but there's a lot of planning that goes into that to make sure that everything is covered, the goals are met. But typically a pen test, you start out doing your reconnaissance, you're doing uh you're you're looking at the target, collecting all the information about it, trying to collect like if you're testing, you know, a network, so you're looking at all the clients on the network servers and workstations, trying to discover what operating systems that they're using, looking for the open ports, because open ports means this is a port that I can connect to on that system that the firewall is not blocking this particular port. So as a pen tester trying to emulate an attacker, you're trying to find a way in. So you're trying to collect as much information on that target as you can. So if you know the operating system, the version, uh, the, the applications that are running on it, the operating system may be secure, but maybe it's running an application that's not secure. So you try to exploit that. So you, you're doing your reconnaissance using different tools. You're using port and service scanners, like Nmap is a very popular one, as well as mass scan. And what it does is you run it against the IP addresses and you can get the you know, as I mentioned, you need the server version and application versions, and it gives you the version information back. And there's some scripts you can use with that that are built for Nmap that will look for certain vulnerabilities. So you try to find the vulnerabilities, and the next step is once you validate those vulnerabilities is try to exploit those. And there's like an online repository called ExploitDB, and it's a database of uh, exploits. So you go out there and see if you can find any kind of exploits to exploit that system. And sometimes it's not an exploit. Maybe it's brute forcing the system. Maybe you're trying like a list of passwords to see if you can hack into the system or guessing passwords or looking for different in, uh, configuration insecurities. Mm. And then the report writing at the end of it, that's one of the things people don't, that don't find so fun, much fun. But at the end of the day, that's what the customer's paying for. That's the only proof that the pen test is, has happened outside of looking at the security logs that, you know, you've been doing scanning and stuff. Oh, it's, it's maybe asking about the report. How does this report look like? Because I can't imagine how it would look like. Is it like 10 pages long, 20 pages long, depending on the application, on the company? How does it look like? It depends on, on the application and the company. I would say you're going to be lucky to, to get 10 pages that short of a report. It's really going to be broken out by you have like a, a section that's executive summary. And this is a high t high level detailed information that, you know, your C-level executives, management that aren't technical can understand, and it tells the risk. It gives you kind of a generalization of the type of vulnerabilities found and what the risks are and the type of attacks that can be done with those and the outcomes of that. So you have that, and then you have the technical sections where you're going, breaking out all the vulnerabilities, the possible risks, how you detected that, and the remediation. And then there's also like a section on the scope showing the scope of all the IP addresses or applications that were in scope for the pen test, as well as, uh, you know, you can make other recommendations based on things you've seen in the environment. If I go to a customer and I'm doing a network pen test, but we're not doing physical testing or social engineering, if we see a need for that test, we'll make recommendations uh, outside, of, outside of that. But the pen test report, you want to give as much detail as you can uh, because you have like a closeout call or debriefing on the pen test and you'll go over that. So you want the customer to have as much information up front that they can go over that before the closeout call or debriefing. That way they can get any questions answered. So the more you can answer up front, the better. And it needs to be, you know, really detailed, like I said. And for people who want to be pen testers, writing skills are very important. Communication skills are very important, often overlooked. I mean, I see people doing more that are more successful in the industry because they have good communication skills and writing skills compared to someone that's just really super technical. Got it. Kim, do you want to add anything here regarding the reporting? Yeah. Um, 
Before I started studying cybersecurity and writing about it full time, I was a desktop. I was a desktop support technician, but it was more uh, through a call center, and we did we did remote support most of the time. And in our ticketing system, it was our job to write in detail what happened on that tech support ticket. What was the customer's problem? How did you resolve it? Um, any pertinent log information or anything like that had to be described. And my center had 60 of us remote tech support agents. And I consistently was told, Kim, your reports are the easiest to understand. If another technician needs to open that ticket and do some more work on it, they like reading your notes. So that was just a few years before I started writing about cybersecurity. Um, honestly, I don't think I have an interest or a talent for coming up with new technologies that could get patents or anything like that. My talent and my skill set is explaining technology, explaining technological matters to multiple audiences, to ordinary lay people, to technical people, you name it. So I think I'm in the right job and I love writing and it was a lot of fun to work on this book with Phil. Um, and I think our book really stands out in the market because it is very accessible. You do not need to like have a computer science degree or even, you know, an IT certification to understand what's written in our book. Mm -hmm. It's good that you mentioned it because I got your book and Phil was so kind to send it to me and I went through it like quickly because I couldn't work through it like in three days and it's I have to say it's really easy to read and you actually don't need a degree for it. That's it's so cool. Um, Phil also mentioned the social engineering aspect. Now my question is when you go to a company and have a contract in some kind, what is like the biggest vulnerability often like if you take maybe the average in a company, is it the human being or is it like hardware? <laughs> Or does it's it human being. human being, right? Yeah, mainly that's it because you can have the you can have everything, and this is not the case. You hardly see this that every the companies have everything right from a technology perspective. But if I send that person an email with a malicious payload and they click on it, that's how they're going to get in. If you look at all the big major breaches, and these are you know actual attackers attacking companies, it's usually some sort of social engineering. They send an email. Uh, they've put up some kind of uh, malware into a website and do a drive-by attack where someone connects to it and they're affected with malware. So it's usually the human element and even physical on the buildings. If you're, you know, you work for a company, you need to take seriously not letting people in the building without a badge, make them go through the proper channels because an attacker, if they can get in front of a keyboard or get into the server room, you know, it's a lot easier to hack into a system if you have physical access. A lot of human sorry, element. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was a finished. lot of people don't know this. A lot of lay people have heard of Kevin Mitnick. Mm -hmm. He was probably the first really infamous cyber attacker. And people are often surprised to learn that the majority of his exploits were social engineering. Like when he, like little boy Kevin Mitnick tricked the bus driver into giving him access tokens to the San Diego bus system or whatever. Mm. He would call call center workers and pretend to be an insider and get credentials out of them. And that was most of the work that Kevin Mitnick did. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you mentioned it because I got his book about social <laughs> engineering and I have to read it though. I remember one story where he put donuts in the freezer for the cops. Because maybe you remember the story. It's funny. Maybe I can link it down in the description. Anyway, it was so funny. Um, what operating system do uh, do pen testers usually use? Is it like different because you have so many operating systems that you can actually work with? Maybe you can give us some insights there. Um, the subjects for pen testing could be any operating system platform from the most common like Windows 10 to like the most obscure Unix implementations. But the operating system that pen testers use to conduct their work most of the time is Kali Linux, which is designed as a pen testing Linux distribution. 
And we strongly recommend that that readers of our book download Kali Linux and try it out when they build their own pen testing lab. Mm -hmm. Anything to add here, Phil, regarding operating systems? Yes, Linux is the most popular platform because a lot of the tools are written for that. And as Kim mentioned, Kali Linux is one of the most popular ones. It's one of the oldest distributions. It was originally Backtrack Linux, but in 2013, they updated it and made it work like more, uh, more like regular Linux distributions, meaning that there's a repository where you install uh, your up updates from and your, your uh, applications. And it's more, you know, before they had like a, a directory, it wasn't set up structured like Linux normally is, but they made a lot of updates. But there's Parrot security uh, Linux distribution or Parrot OS that's a pretty popular pen testing platform that I've recently tested out and I highly recommend. And you can install your own uh, pen testing tools like on Ubuntu. Uh, there's a script or an application called uh, the pen tester framework. And so you can install that and it installs all the different pen testing tools. So you can do that manually. Windows is good to have too, because uh, there's a lot of administrative tools that are good to use on a pen test. So back in my consulting days, I would always have like a, uh, my host operating system would be Mac OS or Ubuntu. And I would be running like a Linux, a Kali Linux uh, VM, as well as like a Windows VM. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be a great idea if you need to build a portable pen testing lab to have, you know, have USB sticks, like bootable USB sticks with Kali and Parrot and Windows 10, Ubuntu and whatnot, have DVDs with the same operating system built onto them. And then if you need to do anything on site, you've got all kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. And, and a, few, a few USB sticks, a few optical disks weighs like nothing. Yes, that's cool. Um, who would you recommend should become a penetration tester? I mean, not everyone, I would assume, could become one. Maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe there are some people who are more talented. Um, you mentioned like good communication skills, for example. I mean, this is something you could learn. But who would you advise to become a penetration tester? Let's say if a kid is interested in becoming a hacker, would that be white or black hacking or something in the middle, like gray hat? What would you recommend for, for people? What are you looking for if you would hire a pen tester? Well, one, one of the things you want to be careful for if you're learning to, to hack is make sure that you're doing it legally through bug bounties, uh, capture the flag, build your own home lab, do things like hack the box to get those skills. And one of the things that's interesting is people getting started out. If you participate in bug bounties, that's a good way to get a job as a web app pen tester. I recently changed jobs back in September. And during my interview process, the consulting company I was talking to said, it's really easy for them. It's easier for them to find web app pen testers than it is network pen testers. And that's because all the bug bounties. So to, to do bug bounties, you don't have to have any experience. You can go sign up on their platforms and start hacking. I mean, you, you're only gonna be successful if you learn, but it's a good way to get hands on. So if someone's really curious about the way things work, if you like to take things apart, because actually my, my story goes way back to when I was a, a small child, like three or four years old, my dad used to take my toys apart, my mechanical toys, and I saw him do it and I would do the same thing, but then I'd get in trouble <laughs> for it because I wasn't supposed to do it, but you know, but I learned from my dad. So anyone that likes, that's curious about how things work, if you like to code, someone that has like a development background, if you're doing development, this may be something good because having that base knowledge as a developer, you're going to make a better application pen tester because you understand that. Just like someone that worked has worked in IT or as a sysadmin, is going to be good at network pen testing or, or generalist pen testing. But no matter where you come from, you need to learn the basics. A lot of people want to jump right into the hacking part, but you got to understand the operating systems and the, the things you're trying to attack. You got to understand the software. So I, I, one of the things I've been sharing here lately is if you're wanting to learn to hack Windows and you don't understand Windows security, learn Windows and learn how to hack it at the same time. You don't have to wait until you completely learn Windows, but as you go along and you're learning security and as those topics are fresh in your mind, it's going to be easier for you to figure out how to hack those. If you want to get into network pen testing specifically, um, enter capture the flag competitions that most cybersecurity events host. 
Uh, you can you can develop skills both in network pen testing and application pen testing. But as bug hunting pertains to applications, you could get more experience with the network penetration side of things by participating in capture the flag competitions. And there are so many of them, there are probably thousands of them every year. And they're open to the general public a lot of the time. And we strongly recommend that if that sort of thing interests you, it could be a great way for you to acquire experience as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Very good tips. I like it. Now I'm very enthusiastic about maybe becoming a pen tester myself. It's so cool. <laughs> um, what, what languages would you recommend for someone who wants to get started in pen testing? What top three languages maybe? What would you say? Python. It's mainly scripting language. Python, Go. Those would be the main ones. Ruby's kind of useful as a pen tester. Python, you're able to really automate stuff. The new popular one has been Golang or, or Go, yep. developed by Google. And it's a cool language because it's programmable. Uh, Python's not programmable, but uh, Golang, you can run as scripts or you can compile it. And the nice thing about it is, especially from a pen tester perspective, if I'm wanting to create a, a program, I can create it on my MacBook Pro and compile it to run on Windows or Linux. Whereas before in the past, normally if you're wanting to compile something on Linux, you have to compile it on Linux. If you're compiling Windows code on like Linux, you have to use something like Wine, it's a Windows emulator or compile it on Windows. So the nice thing with Golang is you're able to uh, create it on any platform and compile it for any platform. And it's beginning, it's becoming to get really popular. PowerShell is another good one too that, that I didn't mention, but PowerShell with that, I like more from, there's a lot of scripts out there that are available you can use. But I say PowerShell, Golang, and Python would be my recommendations. Mm -hmm. Anything you would add here, Kim, in the in the list? Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, it depends on what area you want to go into. Obviously, if you do want to be specifically a web application pen tester, it might help to learn PHP and to learn like some SQL code and stuff like that. If you're going to be like simulating SQL injection attacks, for instance, everything that Phil said sounds like a great idea to me. I've learned a little bit about programming, even though I wouldn't consider myself to be a good programmer. And I, I love Python. I, it's beautiful to look at. It's nice and simple. Um, I like how you can type print equals and then put your string in there and what's in the string just prints. So it's an, it was designed to be a nice user-friendly programming language. So that, that could be a great starting place, mm -hmm. definitely. That's great. Now I want to maybe talk about the downsides. What would you say? Um, why should you not become a pen tester? Let's maybe talk about the mental aspects, uh, stress maybe, customers. Anything like that? What would you What would you say here? Yeah, I would say if, if if you have a hard time under stress, that could be difficult. But you could work as an internal employee for a company and not a consultant. But at the same time, too, you're going to have to be in those closeout calls or debriefing meetings, going over the report. And sometimes people take pretty personally that you're able to hack into their system. You know, some of these developers spend all this time. It's like you're telling them that their child's ugly, and they get offended. So. And, you know, when you're going to those meetings, you have to be really prepared and show them the details. That's like I mentioned earlier in the reports. They're really explaining the vulnerabilities, how you found those. So, yeah, you, you really need to, uh, if it, if you're, you're stressed out, you know, easily, if you can't work late hours, because sometimes on pen test, you have to work some, some, some strange hours. Uh, I had a airline, major airlines that I did a pen test for back at my last consulting job. And the testing hours there was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So if you don't like the late hours and stuff, that can be kind of difficult. If you if you have a hard time with technology and figure things out, then it may not be for you. But honestly, there's so many different areas in pen testing. I think a lot of people can find areas that appeal more to them. Uh, when you start out, you're a generalist and you're doing a little bit of everything. But sometimes it's more fun to specialize. You know, for me, out of all the different types of pen testing, the application stuff is a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. It might help to be someone who can both work on your own without immediate supervision and work well with others. I know it sounds like cheesy HR speak, 
but an effective pen tester will be able to work well with others and communicate well with others and at the same time be able to work well on their own for like several hours at a time or more. So if spending more than half an hour away from people makes you feel lonely, maybe you're too extroverted for the job. Mm. And if you can't cooperate with other people, then maybe you don't have the people skills for the job. Got it. Okay, something in the middle then, so to speak. <laughs> what what, yeah. what about the, the learning process? That might also be a bit daunting and frustrating for a lot of people because there are things that change so quickly and you have to keep yourself up to date and read a lot of stuff. I, I would assume, how do you tackle that per personally? That, that, that's often an issue with the kind of work that I do because I have to have a good, a good general understanding of all areas of cybersecurity because I, I, I'm expected to write about any topic. I can't possibly become a really specialized expert in any area. There's always a lot that I'm never going to understand and I'm never going to learn. But if you just make an effort to learn something new each day and stay with the community and read about cyber attacks and read about new technologies, if you have certifications, keep up with what you need, your CSCs or whatever to keep your certifications current, that's as much as you can do. Don't expect that you can master everything. You'll never be able to do that. Have realistic expectations for yourself. And as long as you've made an effort to learn something new every day, then you've done the best you possibly could. And you should pat yourself on the back and relax and enjoy a coffee. Mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> Philip, anything? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot to keep up with pen testing. It's interesting. I have a a good friend of mine and one of my mentees that got into security, I guess he got into security about four or five years ago now. And, and he was just talking about how it is so difficult to keep up with so much. And, you know, starting out, you want to be a generalist and kind of get a feel for all of it. But I think at some point you find your strengths and focus on that area, then it's easier to keep up because if you're doing, you know, a lot of people are doing network application and cloud And that's kind of tough to keep up with. So for instance, if you're doing network, maybe you do networking, networking cloud and, and wireless, or maybe you specialize in application because there's so much to keep up with from a security and technology perspective. They're coming up with different programming frameworks, you know, before PHP and your JSP pages are really popular. Now you have a lot of your Java backends that are popular. So it's really hard to keep up with something and that base knowledge you build up in an area It's easy to learn new things. So sometimes it's a good idea not to spread yourself too thin with trying to do everything. You know, find something you work that you like and and stick with that. Because one of the things, it's just kind of like they say, jack of all trades, master of none. You'll be okay at a lot of things, but if you really want to get good, it's good to specialize. You take a look, look at some of the best in the industry. Some people specialize in writing tools. Some people specialize in active directory hacking or cloud. And you see the stuff they put out. That's all the stuff they're putting in there. And you wonder why they're really great at what they do. It's because they specialize and focus on those areas. Mm -hmm. Maybe you guys can talk about the job market in general and how the job market looks like. Like if you are a pen tester and you want to get a job out there, how does it look like? Is it easy? Is it quite difficult? What would you say? Maybe, Kim, you, you can start with that. Uh, I, th I think the demand for pen testing careers in general is only going to grow because computer systems are driving more and more facets of our everyday lives. Cyber attacks are going to have worse and worse impacts on people's everyday lives. For instance, fully automated IoT cars have been tested for the past several years now. Imagine a cyber attack to those vehicles. It would be very deadly. So basically computing is, is uh, in, Computing and the internet is taking over lots of different facets of our everyday lives. So the demand is only going to grow to security test all those technologies. Cool. Phil, you also talked about um, how much you can actually earn as a pen tester. Maybe you want to go into the job market, but also how much you can actually earn as a pen tester, which is like crazy. 
Yeah, there's currently the, it's it's like the job market's really good. And, you know, pen testing is not something new, but it's something that in recent years people see the need for. Whenever I got into pen testing in 2012, it was mainly consultants doing the work. And there was so much pen testing that needed to be done. A lot of companies had to hire their own pen testers. I used to work for a major U.S. bank and we had like thousands of applications that had to be tested. And so we had like a team of 13 people. So there's a lot of need. It's not, like I said, it's not a new job, but people are realizing it's probably one of the, one of the fastest growing jobs. Uh, as far as difficulty to get in, that's going to depend on certifications you have and experience. So if you have like an IT or security background, it's going to be easier to get into pen testing than coming in with no experience at all. So getting your foot in the door sometimes can be the most difficult part, uh, but getting certifications like the OSCP, which requires you to go through a, an exam that's a practical exam. So you have five servers that you have to hack into. You have to hack into all five, I believe, to get the 75 points required to pass that test. Uh, but money-wise, like U.S. dollars, someone starting out with no experience, new, would, would you know, like in my area in the central region, is making like $60,000 like $60, a year, and this is, you know, working for a company, uh, you can make up to, once you get like three years worth of experience, then you're making, you know, over a hundred thousand to $130,000 a year. If you're doing, you know, contracting, like I do, I'm, I do freelance pen testing and I'm getting paid over a hundred dollars an hour. You know, if you're, if you're doing your own thing, then you could charge two or $300 an hour. If you got your own business, Bug bounties are a good way to make money. Uh, it's a little more difficult because you have to find bugs to get paid. But there's a guy in Canada, his handle is a day is new. Uh, he does all he does is bug bounty. He makes like half a million dollars a year. It's not easy. You, it's a lot of hard work and, and it takes a lot of studying to get to that level. But that's just the, the opportunities out there. And pen testing pays pretty well. I mean, it's. Um, and, you know, even some jobs you can work for a company that makes security hardware. So, I mean, security hardware or just network hardware in general. So, like some like Cisco or Palo Alto, these companies have people that work internally to look for bugs in their systems. So, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity out there and it pays really well. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned uh, gaining experience. Uh, at the beginning of the mm -hmm. podcast, you mentioned mm -hmm. Capture the Flag, which is one possibility you could you could do. Um, what other options are there except of maybe yeah. bug bounding and... Yeah, then there's also like you can do like hack the box. Uh, hack the box is a good option because you're getting hacking skills. As far as getting hands-on experience, you could do pro bono uh, pen testing. So you can find, you know, some schools, uh, churches, different types of religious organizations that don't have the money to pay for pen tests or, or charities, and you can do pen tests for them for free. Install. And one of the Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Install your own virtual machines. Mm -hmm. uh, I love using Oracle VirtualBox as a virtualization client. Many people love using VMware. You can get, you know, disk images for every major operating system and a lot of the minor ones as well. Make virtual machines out of them and run your own exploits inside of those virtual machines. This virtual machine will sandbox your exploits from your host machine. And it's a safe target because you own it. You're allowed to hack stuff that you own. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. Thanks, Kim. Um, when it comes to courses itself, what courses would you personally recommend? Maybe Phil, if you want. Yeah, as far as, as, far as courses go, you know, it's gonna depend on your level where you're starting out. Ultimately, if you're wanting to um, learn pen testing, and, and get a certification that's going to help you get a job. Your SANS courses and your offensive security courses are going to be good. But also eLearn Security is great. That's a little more affordable than like the SANS certifications. eLearn Security is probably a good, a, a good place to start because they have like a, their, their student pen tester course. And this is, you know, provide, you know, this is a course uh, targeted towards people that don't have pen test experience. So they have that student pen tester course and they have the professional pen tester course. So Pentester Academy goes into a lot of depth, not really expecting you to know much on the subject. And then when you get into your SANS and offensive security courses, they're expecting you to have some kind of technical background to 
to take those courses. But those are, you know, some good options. Yeah, and then you have like Pentester Academy and Pentester Lab that offer like subscriptions that uh, that are really good resources as well. Mm-hmm. Kim, anything else do you want to add? Yeah, that's all. That, those are all suggestions that, that we both recommend in the book. Uh, so you really, if you need courses to help prepare for certain certifications, for instance, you have lots to choose from um, and lots of books that you can read uh, to prepare yourself for each of the certifications as well. We do get into specific certifications for pen testers in our book, not only the CEH and the OSCP, but lots of other offensive security certs and e-learn security certs and whatnot. I can sit, I think if you can acquire some certifications, it would be a great investment in your career. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a world where HR managers and hiring directors may insist that you have certain certifications or certain roles. So there have been people who've had successful pen testing careers without any certs. It, it's not impossible, never say never. But if you want to increase your odds of gainful employment in the industry, then training for and writing certification exams is a, is a worthy investment, definitely. Mm-hmm. I would be interested in what is like the highest certificate that you can get in the pen test business. There's like an advanced offensive security cert, like the OSCP is the entry level offensive security certification for penetration testers and hundreds. The most advanced pen testing certification in general might be the OSEP. So as I mentioned, as as we mentioned in the book, you are not gonna write your OSEP without writing the OSCP first. So some of these certs, you need to have more junior certs before you write exams for the more senior certs. Phil, do you want to add something here? Yes. And your offensive security certs and your e-learning security certs are not going to be question and answer certs. Like the SAN certifications, although they're open book, they're pretty difficult. I have got the web app pen testing cert from SANS and they let you take your course manuals in there and do open book, but you've got to know the topic or be able to locate that pretty quickly. Now the offensive security certifications and e-learn securities certifications, you have to perform a pen test. So you actually have to go through and do a pen test, uh, with, with e-learn security. Uh, you know, it's more performing a pen test with the offensive security stuff. You're performing a pen test, but you have to have, like a, a successful rating on on hacking into systems. So one of the, the most some of the most uh, advanced would be your your OSCE from offensive security, which is like an exploit development in advanced pen testing certification, which they're getting ready to redo that cert next year. It was one test before and now it's gonna be like a combination of three different tests. So it's gonna be you'll you'll get a broader you're going to get a lot more depth in the three, three main areas of pen testing. And then the SANS uh, advanced pen testing and exploit uh, writing course is a good one too. It's pretty high level. You learn how to write your own exploits. So you're not just dependent on downloading exploits. So those are, are pretty advanced. And the SANS, they have some pretty specialized stuff. They have things around uh, industrial controls, mobile devices, and so does eLearn Security. They have some mobile application courses as well these certifications can be very expensive to study for and write it might it might uh, help you help newcomers to the industry relax a little bit if they understand that there are lots of jobs in this industry that you can get with a, just a ceh and an oscp and having maybe a few capture the flag competitions behind your belt so don't, don't, don't get overwhelmed that it might take you six or seven years to get to a point where you're writing the most advanced certification exams. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, maybe before we wrap things up, I want to ask uh, maybe a social question. When it comes to social engineering, do you see yourself sometimes in real life when you meet with others? 
see yourself social engineering other people? That would be interesting for me. <laughs> what would you say? Kim, maybe? Yeah, um, social engineering in some form or the other has existed long before computers. Yeah. Uh, I think of the trope of the, uh, the uh, medicine salesman in the Victorian era in the you know, the 19th century cowboy days in a, in a wagon going from town to town and trying to sell their snake oil as a cure-all for all kinds of diseases. Um, that, that, even though that existed years before computers ever did, that was a form of social engineering. Any sort of being a con man is social engineering. Uh, if you go to a casino, you will see social engineering everywhere all the time. Yeah. Lots of winks and nods in the direction of the poker table and that sort of thing. Mm. So I, I, I know it's a different topic, but cryptography has existed long before computers as well. Secret messages were used in wartime hundreds and hundreds of years ago. There were ciphers that existed long before computers. They might have been carved into stone. And so it, sometimes when people learn about computer science and about cybersecurity, they'd be surprised with how many concepts have existed in some form or another before there were computers. Mm -hmm. Even, especially when you, when you deal with social engineering, maybe Phil, you can comment on that. Um, do you see yourself more, doing it more because you're doing it actively on the side that you see maybe if you meet a new person that you try to social engineer them in some kind of kind of way that maybe you're not aware of yourself? Well, I would say I don't. There's some concepts used in social engineering that I think are helpful because salespeople have used those type of things for years. Uh, Chris Hagnatty has a really great book on on social engineering. He's got a couple of them out. And one of the things I've, you know, not necessarily socially, it, it's the art of persuasion. I'd say I probably use that a lot. A couple of funny examples is I, I'm a member of Dallas Hackers Association, a local Dallas meetup. It's, it's a hacker-based meetup. And we had some guy, before he actually came to a Dallas Hackers meeting, I had just, I, you know, to get my, get people to join my classes, get the word out. I would go to the different meetups and social media mentioned my classes. He had come on, on the message board and missing, message, uh, mentioned a CEH course at another uh, community college, Certified Ethical Hacking course. And he mentioned this course and I was worried that people on the message board would mistake it with my class. So I got on there and mentioned mine. And before it was said and done, I had this guy persuaded to take my class and he took both of my classes. But he took both of my classes from that. And then recently, this topic of becoming a pen tester, uh, I may have not been the first one to speak about it, but uh, when I started speaking about it, no one else really was. And so here recently, it's gotten to be a popular topic. And I noticed recently, uh, probably starting summer, there's two or three other people that have been doing talks on becoming a pen tester. And I saw someone, one of the uh, other meetups, the cybersecurity nonprofit a group had posted up about one of their speakers were doing ask me anything about becoming a pen tester and it had some other talks on becoming a pen tester i saw that and i posted up about kim and my book and i thought i said yeah this topic has become very popular you know i you know mentioned kind of the history of my talk and then now it's a book and i thought this is uh, this is good timing for this book this topic has become popular And this person that runs this other organization had just posted about that. I was hoping he would see it. Sure enough, he saw it. And then he invited us to be on his podcast. <laughs> Funny. So those type of things, not really trying to manipulate people, but just trying to, you know, use opportunity to insert myself. So some things that could be used for social engineering, I guess. Mm -hmm. Two last questions. The one would be, who did you write the book for uh, specifically? It, the book is for anyone who is even the slightest bit curious about having a career as a penetration tester. 
Uh, we both, Phil and I, were very careful to make the book as accessible as possible. Um, all the technical terms that we use in the book are defined in the glossary. So if you're, if you're young, if you're like a very smart 13-year-old, or if you're in your 50s and you're thinking about a new career, we've, we wrote the book for as many different groups of people as possible who could possibly want to be a pen tester. That's awesome. And before I thank you so much that you even participated in this podcast, which is just great for me, and I'm very enthusiastic to reading your book. It's, it's so good. And thanks again, Phil, for sharing it. It's really great. Now, if the phone rings right now and you hear yourself on the phone, but just starting out as a pen tester, what advice would you give yourself when you started out? What would you say? Maybe, Phil, you can, you can go first. Well, one of the things I would I would tell myself is is to take more time and be patient and thoroughly learn the subject. Because when you speed through the learning process, then you've got to go back and start all over again. And this is some advice that I started to give my students. Like last year, uh, someone I know from the local community had started pen testing. Their background was reverse engineering, super sharp hacker. And one, one day he was talking about how he's had to go back and learn the assembly programming language, he took it in school, but in school, you know, you really didn't have to do much to prove that you knew it. I think it's probably a question answer exam. And, you know, he said he really wished that he would have paid attention and learned it because now he's having to learn it. So that's what I'd say. Take the time to, to really learn the subject when you're going through co even college courses, you know, like you're an engineer, the engineering stuff that you're taking, make sure you focus on that. The stuff you, that you're going to need, Make sure you learn it. Your art appreciation, you know, getting by and passing that exam on that, that may be fine. Or music appreciation, if it's not tied to your, your field, but the things you need for your field, make sure to let it, you know, focus on and learn it and your communication skills and those sort of things. Hmm. So I say take the time to learn it, thoroughly learn it. Great advice. As you probably remember from reading our book, there is a whole chapter on doing a skills inventory. And even if your professional background is not in anything computer related, chances are you have some transferable skills into a pen testing career. Like for example, if you've worked in customer service and you've had to explain stuff to customers, when you're a pen tester, <coughs> your pen testing clients are your customers and you're going to have to explain things to them. So, You'd be surprised how many different occupations and experiences can teach you important lessons that can help you be a more effective pen tester. Mm. That's also what you've written in the book, what you have given basically as advice to yourself, to your younger self. Would you, would you say that? Yeah, I, and I, I guess this is more specific to me. I would have told 10-year-old Kimberly, who was fascinated by computers, not to listen to your teacher who says that you have to be a math genius in order to work with computers and to not listen to your teacher when she keeps telling you directly and indirectly that you're dumb and you'll never amount to anything. Mm. And there are areas of IT and computer science where you really do need to be a math whiz, like if you're a cryptographer, if you work in assembly languages a lot, But I have like high school graduate math and I've, I've fared just fine. So I, I would encourage, you know, young boys, young girls, uh, children of all genders, uh, older adults of all genders, people of all walks of life, do not get discouraged. Do not listen to people who tell you that you don't look like a hacker or you're not the typical type of person who works with computers for a living and just go for it. You'll be surprised with how competent and skillful you can be. That's probably one of the best motivational speeches I've heard this year. Kim, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, with that being said, guys, I really enjoyed the podcast. This was the first pen tester or ethical hacking podcast I have on my channel. And I'm sure that my audience has learned a lot from this podcast. And maybe, who knows, we have a second session in the future, maybe. And uh, again, thanks so much, Phil and Kim, and hopefully see you soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Take care.